Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome tonight to the broadcast. My name is Elder Tamel Brown, and I got some distinguished guests, some distinguished brothers with me tonight, and we're going to have this uh, special conversation. Uh, this is the SSK Minavella, the keys to developing a successful relationship. And I'm getting ready to add these brothers in, and I'm telling you, they are ready and they are anticipating. Going ahead and letting you know their feelings, how they feel about this particular subject, how they feel about uh, this particular topic. They are ready to go, and I hope that you are ready with us. Uh, feel free to share your your your, your comments. Uh, feel free to, to to put in what you like. As far as if you're feeling these brothers, if you feel what they're talking about, if if you like what they're saying, definitely let them know in the comments. And so um, I'm going to let these brothers introduce themselves in just a moment. Uh, once again, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Elder Tamel Brown of Fruit Bear Ministries. I'm also the founder of Single Save with No Kids, and I'm also a singer songwriter. So get ready uh, for the single coming out this year. It's all about you. And so uh, go out and get it once it comes out. Request it on the radio. But tonight, this is all about the keys to developing a successful relationship. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to start from the top. Uh, to the bottom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start on the top with Lonnie. And go ahead, Lonnie, and, and introduce yourself. Okay, I'm um, I'm uh, Minister Lonnie Massengill out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I've been an ordained minister for about 25 years. Um, background in customer service, uh, motivational speaker, and uh, Toastmaster. And I'm also the founder of a charity, a Facebook group called Charity, where we talk about and, and express positive things that goes on, whether it be love, whether it be life itself. And so we have singles and married people on there. And we even get, sometimes we get advice from couples on how to stay, have a, a great relationship. So it's all about giving out positive energy and everything. With so much bad news going on, we about giving out positive energy, so I'm glad to be here tonight. And um, and I'm Lonnie Mascow of Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, sir. Glad to have you as part of the broadcast. Uh, glad to have you again, as always. And yes, sir. Let's introduce to uh, Mr. Christopher Gordon. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Good evening, gentlemen, and all of single, save, and no kids. I am Christopher Gordon. I'm representing for the bottom of the map, Houston, Texas, the southernmost region in the United States. <laughs> so it's good to be on the on the uh, chat and on a panel with such distinguished ministers, hoping that we can shed some light. Uh, I've been in ministry going on 12 years, so uh, I'm sure that's nothing compared to the other <laughs> fellow co-laborers. But it's good to be on the panel. Hopefully, I'm single. Hopefully we can share some light. I'm in the great state of Texas in the city of Houston, where we have an abundance of the most gorgeous women that you have ever seen on earth. All right. So hopefully something all right. done. <laughs> I'm telling you all, if y'all have never been to Houston, you are missing out. It is an oasis. Mm. Um, no other. So uh oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good to me, brother. <laughs> yeah, I'm an ambassador for all things Houston. So it's good to meet you all. Absolutely glad to have you as part of the broadcast as well. Definitely great to meet you too, Christopher. And my man, Omar, go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. Okay. Uh, well, everyone, uh, my name is Omar Lyles, founder and CEO of Agape Love Network. I am a certified life coach and mental health coach in mental health uh, awareness, community activist, community volunteer, etc. I'm just happy and blessed to actually be on this uh, panel discussion with my brothers. Uh, here tonight, uh, I frequent them uh, a number of times uh, before, and I'm just blessed to actually be on here tonight. Absolutely, absolutely glad to have you, uh, Dr. Omar, as always. And so these brothers bring a unique perspective. 
They all have, you know, a, a different uh, personalities. And I know they got a lot of flavor to add uh, to this uh, conversation. Uh, and so um, why don't you let's do something different. Why don't you um, I know um, Christopher was real, uh, was real candid and telling us where he was from. So where are you guys from and uh, where are you residing right now? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I'm, I'm a Jersey, raised in, uh, uh, born in Orange, New Jersey, uh, raised in East Orange, New Jersey, Naughtyville, home of Naughty by Nature, a couple of blocks away from me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Queen Latifah, okay. the OGs, Lords of the Underground, the Artifacts, the Works, Jersey yeah. in the house, you know. So pretty much that's pretty much basically where I'm pretty much been born and, and, and raised here in New Jersey. Well, I am from the great state of Ohio. I grew up in Canton, Ohio, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, where we had several classes that was inducted on last week. And, you know, home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. But I've been in Atlanta for about close to 36 years now. And um, I'm 62 years old. I guess I'm the oldest of the group here, but um, I'm, I'm very, very active there. So, so that's where I'm from. Absolutely. And I know you told us, uh, uh, Christopher, already, but you want to add anything in there, sir? <laughs> uh, I love Houston. I've been other places, seen other places, but I always find my way back to Houston. I feel like a, a, an innate sense of calling to this city and hopefully that uh, my, Houston is good to me. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes, sir. Uh, let's go ahead and get the conversation started. And so once again, we're talking about tonight, the keys to developing a successful relationship. And let's start with this first question. And once again, we're gonna start from the top and go down to the bottom. But what do you feel is one of the main reasons why Christians are developing successful relationships? And I'll start at the top with Minister Lonnie. Um, one of the reasons why Christians are not developing is because um, um, one reason I think is that we're not being obedient to the, the word of God. And the Bible teaches us to um, like the fruits of the spirit to have a great relationship, especially when we talked about it in first Corinthians and in my study that we don't, we don't obey what the word of God says especially when it comes to the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, happiness. And number one, now, number two, the churches are not really teaching it or taking responsibility to teach what needs to be done because sometimes the church's leadership don't know. And when the people who have the gifts, they can teach having a relationship. They don't let them, they won't let them, you know, teach it and everything because they got, they got the wrong people teaching it. And a lot of times, to me, I think it's, especially when it comes to marriage, I think there's some disobedience there. And and I'm, 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 I'm really thinking marriage right now because I grew up with a lot of people and I got friends that have been married. My parents were married for 39 years. And so God ordains marriage. And Hebrews 13, 4 says marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled, but adulterers and whoremongers God will judge. And so obedience is going to be the, the key and commitment and our and good intentions. If you don't have those, then chances are the relationship and marriage um, may not survive. Because when it comes to me at my age, I date, you know, I mean, I'm only interested in dating with a purpose, dating with a purpose, which which means marriage and everything. Because um, I don't believe in, in shacking up. I don't believe in um, in all of that. And so it, it's really a lot more than what I'm saying. Uh, and, and I know you brothers got some perspective on this, but that's my that's been my observations uh, over the past, you know, since I've been in ministry. And many people, and you'd be surprised how many people share with me their relationships, successes, and hordes. I mean, more than I, like, you know, more than, I care to really share it. And some of it I can't share on the air because I have to, you know, because there's some stuff that's deep. So it's really a lot more to it than that. And it takes some explanation. But for the sake of time, I don't have time to do it. So 
Absolutely. Certainly do understand your perspective and where you're coming from uh, concerning things. And so I definitely agree with you. I agree uh, that uh, those are definitely uh, some of the reasons why uh, some of our Christian relationships aren't working out. And I'm going to go ahead to yeah. uh, Christopher. What do you think about uh, that that same question, sir? Uh, what do you uh, feel is uh, one of the main reasons why Christians aren't developing successful relationships? Well, I, I, I always start with, I think the world right now as we stand is not in a good place when it comes to relationships. And uh, if you take Christians out of the picture and just look at us in our natural state when it comes to just man and woman, men and women in general are in a bad place, but more specifically when it comes to black men and black women, we're in a very much worse state. And so that's just even Christianity aside, no church, no anything, no God, no religion. It's not in a good place right now, even outside of the body of Christ. Now, when you add the whole Christian element to that, uh, you would think that us as Christians would have a different solution that we'll be able to solve those problems. But what I'm finding out is, especially when dealing with Christians, whether it be old or young, we are more, I guess you could say pluralistic. So when the world has a certain set of issues and when you now bring the same type of relationship issues with Christians, there's a kind of religious pluralism where you have the pluralism of all the issues and problems that come with having a Christian relationship and you couple those same issues and problems with, with having a worldly relationship. Because a lot of times when dealing with young adults, adults, they take the same issues and stuff from the world and they you have to deal with all those sets of problems of the world and the sets of problems of, of the kingdom. And it just becomes like a bad mix of pluralism. We take the philosophies of the world and we try to merge those with the philosophies of the kingdom then we have the same issues of the world. And it's just, it's a bad mix. It's almost as if we would do better either just give me an unchristian person sometimes because at least you know you can deal with those set of issues. But when you start merging the two and we, we're calling this pluralistic society, it just gets all jumbled up and confusing. And I think that's where we are right now when it comes to Christians. When you see, talk to them, they have the same problems and issues that people in the world have. But then they still mixing it up with the kingdom issues and it gets all mixed up and all messed up. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. And you make a really good point. I mean, I, I, I can agree with you concerning that because um, a lot of people are saying that some of our Christian relationships are looking worse than some of the uh, relationships that's going on in the world, you know, with some of these uh, celebrities and seem like some of these celebrity marriages are doing <laughs> a lot better than us. But we should be really set an example because uh, we have Christ in our lives. Uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there and let Omar go ahead and expound on the same thing. Uh, how do you feel about it, sir? Uh, wow. Uh, the explanations that everybody was giving, you know, pretty much uh, was on point. Uh, I, I would also emphasize that uh, it's the culture that's surrounding the church where the church have allowed, not, not all churches, but there are people who have allowed the world to influence their way of thinking, their ideal uh, 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 of a lifestyle, the, uh, the idea of what a Christian is to be, the perspective of, of coming from the word of God. Uh, what, what does the Bible say of how are we to be in relationships? Have any of us read any of the scriptures in the New Testament? Um, as far as uh, wives and husbands is concerned in, in the book of uh, Corinthians. Um, have you read the first and second chapters? Uh, what does the Ten Commandments actually display? What does the Bible talk about adultery and fornication and all those type of things? You know, but we allow the culture to influence us. And a lot of us, we get hyped up about what the world is saying. And then we sort of shape and mold that into our own thinking because it, what the word of God is supposed to do is supposed to shape and mold us. We're not to allow the, the world to mold and shape us and to shape our thinking. And to like, like uh, Christopher uh, Gordon was talking about, there's a mixture. And so when you have that combination, uh, your way of thinking becomes muddy. Mm. And so when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, uh, when you're, when your line of thinking becomes muddy, you can't really think straight on how the gospel is actually supposed to impact your life and how to actually deal with relationships. 
you know, because we've allowed the culture, we allowed the TV shows, we allowed uh, the ladies have allowed their sister girls to tell them how how they should be with the with the men in their lives. The, the same True. thing with the men; they've allowed the brothers to tell them how they should operate, unless if they're not Christian. Um, and so we have a lot of that going on. But until we get down into the deep rootness of the gospel and how how it is explained uh, with relationship, then we'll have a better understanding of how we should be in relationships. Man, man, that's that's good. That's real good. That's real good, Dr. Omar. And so um, I'm really feeling what you were saying concerning uh, those particular issues and those things. And everybody made great points. Um, I like the point uh, that, that Lonnie made, uh, according to what he was saying, that uh, Christians aren't uh, totally following the word of God. And then Christopher came back uh, with saying, you know, that there's so many issues that's uh, taking place that our, our relationships and 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 in our in our dating experience, they're just not uh, looking uh, different than any other uh, relationship outside of Christendom, you know. And so, uh, it's definitely some things that we definitely have to think about. And so, I think, in in in, in my uh, opinion on things, is I just think that you know, uh, black men and black women, we have to uh, ask ourselves you know, different questions about how uh, we are and, and if we are treating each other uh, the best with the right treatment, because I think that's what it comes down to. How are we treating each other uh, in these dating relationships? Even if the relationship is not working out, uh, it doesn't have to be where it becomes uh, to a point where even though you, you broke up, you hate each other, you can't stand each other. I think that if you you both uh, Christians and you're both saved and have a relation with the Lord, depending on, I guess, what happens that causes a breakup. But I think we can kind of even end some of these relationships very cordially, you know? And so I think that's that's important as well. And so I think uh, we have to ask our questions, uh, ask ourselves questions like, am I a hard person to deal with? You know, you got to be honest with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, do I have a good attitude or or do I have a bad attitude? Uh, am I an encouraging person? You know, you you, you got to think about that. Are we encouraging one another as Christians, as people in, in dating situations? Um, you know, so uh, do I reciprocate love? Do I reciprocate care and concern? Or is it just one sided? Is it all about me? And so we got to ask ourselves some of these questions. And once we're able to answer these questions individually, then we can kind of uh, take a, a look uh, uh, at our lives and then uh, look ourselves in the mirror and say, am I, as a woman or man uh, that represents Jesus Christ, am I treating my woman as uh, the word of God says in Ephesians 5, you know, uh, you know, that a husband should, should love the wives as uh, Christ loved the church. And also the women, are you being submissive? Are you referencing uh, your your husband, as uh, you know, uh, it says that you would reverence God. And I know we are not in marriage. Well, you know, we're, we're not married. None of us are married. But do you have that mentality to get to that point to where, you know what? Are you, are, do you have the mentality to get to the place of engagement to marriage? And so uh, that's uh, some of the things I think that's causing us not to uh, have successful relations. We're not looking at ourselves. You know, because we have, if we be honest with one another, brothers, we have caused some women some pain, you know, just to be honest, uh, uh, yeah, whether it was yeah. intentional or not. Uh, we've done some things. We said some things to hurt these women. And of course, these women have said some things and done some things to hurt us as well. And we got to own that. I just really believe we got to own that. Anybody yes. can, can jump in if you have any uh, thoughts on what I just said. Yes, Tomel. Yeah, I I agree with you. We have uh, done some some hurt to women. Even I did. I admit, you know, you know, back in the day, and I regret it. I did a message called "Sister, I'm Sorry." I did about last year during the pandemic, and I and I really poured my heart out to the women to say, you know, we're sorry for the pain that we conflicted, whether it be ghosting or like I did, I, I've ghosted a few women stuff, and I re, and I regret it, and I hate I did it, 
and and then I missed out on some relationships because I really wasn't paying attention, and 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 I and I regret that too. But one of the things that bothers me is that when you try to to be sincere to women and establish a relationship with them, they 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 bring up their past. They have a tendency to bring up their past, and I know it's going to sound kind of harsh to the men, but they ruin it for the rest of us. They ruin it for the rest of us and everything. The guys that did things worse than I did, and they they ghost them, they catfish them, they did all kinds of stuff to them. And, and then when you try to get with them, they say, "Well, um, no, just because you know, just because I've been hurt in the past, and they think that I'm going to hurt them again." But I want to say this, and I'm going to move on. You know, and to the sisters out there, um, there are some good men out there. We are not your enemy. We don't want to be your enemy. We want to be your friend. We want to be someone that we can establish a meaningful, wholesome relationship with you. We're not your enemies. Ladies, please hear me when I tell you this. I'm pleading you. We're not your enemies. You know, we're not here to try to say all this stuff that they say out in the world. Hey, baby, and all that stuff. And you got a, you got a nice booty. No, I, I'm not looking at that. I'm trying to be sincere. We want your heart. Because, you know, because I'm past all that stuff. I'm too old to be playing games. And one thing I've realized that love is not a game, people. Love is not a game. If I don't say anything else, love is not a game. Dr. Tabell. Yes, sir. And But, Lonnie, yeah, I'm looking at all characteristics. I'm looking at that booty, too, Lonnie. I got to be attracted to, to what? <laughs> Well, that's true, but I'm looking at everything. I, I I'm looking know, at every but... physical, <laughs> physical attraction is important too. And I know I feel what you're yeah. saying, man. but the main thing is what you said, Lionel. I'm, I'm being serious now. But yeah. The main yeah. thing is <laughs> the main thing is was what you said. We're looking at your character, and we do want to treat you right, and do want mm -hmm. to treat you as queens, as mm -hmm. uh, Lonnie said. But yeah, I'm looking at everything, and I, I think attraction is important, and I think physical absolutely is, is very important in order to have a successful relationship as well. And so I guess we'll move on uh, to the next question. One second. Oh yeah, go ahead, Christopher, go ahead and jump in there. Let, let me kind of uh, attach myself to what, what Brother Lonnie was saying, Reverend Lonnie. Sure. I, I want to say this, like, and, and I get it when you were saying that sisters, we're not your enemies and we want to know your heart and things like that. And, and someone in the chat wrote that that trust wall comes up. And I don't, I, I can't repeat this enough. I know like, cause I, I was, I was doing another relationship symposium and one of the ladies who supposed to be one of the teachers, instructors was talking about, oh, because, you know, uh, I, I've been through so much that the next guy is going to have to really earn my trust and do all that. And, and my advice to her was we're supposed to be the teachers for this relationship symposium. I said, sister, don't date. You know, if, if that's where you are right now, then don't date because it's not up to the next man to have to work hard to get past your issues, your trust for what the last guy did. And I said, like, I told her this, if you come, if I'm at a restaurant sitting down and I, and I sit down at a table and the waitress comes to me and hands me and said, the last person who sat here did not pay their tab. So here you go. It's up to you. I'm not paying it. <laughs> Because number one, I didn't do that. I don't, the last guy might have skipped out, and so now your tab is short and all that. But I'm not going to pay that because it's not my responsibility to pay for what the last customer did. I tell women like that: if you are not in a good place to give black men, to give black women a clean slate, don't date. Mm -hmm. Get out of the game. Go heal yourself. Get yourself together. Because nobody deserves life is hard enough mm. by itself. Nobody deserves to be with somebody who has to pay for what the last person did. I, I'm trying to, and and I've had to deal with women. That's sometimes we've only had one date to where it's like, look, I'm not going to listen to another guy's lecture. That's not how I operate. I try to operate with even if we don't work out, and by I say work out, meaning we don't end up in marriage and proposal and, and engagement. We can all of my relationships. I try to end well, where there's like I don't believe in bad breakups, man. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. I got good intentions for you. I love the Lord. You love the Lord. We should be able to end this thing amicably. So mm -hmm. 
I don't in my all my relationships, we end on a good note. So I'm not going to pay for what this other guy did to you and all this stuff like that. Sister, go tell him that lecture. That's not me. If you if you're not ready to get on to have a future with what we're trying to do, then this ain't going to work already. And I would just say, man, ladies, if you're not there yet, stop dating. Stop healing yourself. It's not up to these gentlemen who are on this panel to have to work extra hard for what the last guy did. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm to that point where if you're not healed like that, you need to get out the game because I, I don't got nothing for you. Man, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, you made some great points and uh, about, you know, a, a woman being healed. And, 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 you know, I do I do know men and women, as you say, they do have those defense mechanisms up. Uh, because of what the last guy did to them or uh, men also what the last woman did to us. And so some some women hold on to that since we particularly talking about women, some women hold on to that and they try to make uh, the next guy coming in pay for uh, some of the wrong that the other guy has done, even though the other guy coming in is really trying to love them. is really a good dude, but they still have some resentment, some resentment and some hurt from the past from another relationship. And so uh, you make a really a uh, good point. Um, both of you, you, Lonnie, uh, and um, also Omar. Did you want to uh, add to that, Omar? Uh, no, but you, but you know what? Um, uh, as it is pretty much as it is when you're in a relationship, right? Uh, people do give people a hard time based on their, their past relationships, and they do make it hard for the next person. Uh, and so healing is the solution before you actually get to the next phase. You can't get to the next phase without working on yourself because you bring up a whole lot of toxicity, toxic, goodness, my goodness, <laughs> toxic uh, uh, vibes to the next relationship that you're actually getting into. And that person must just might just walk away from it because he say, he's going to say, well, I can't deal with it. You know, because she's toxic, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and so you may get into a world where you may be even become a little toxic because you have to deal with another person who is toxic as well. You know, True. and so you have to sit up there and deal with all those kinds of things in a relationship. And nobody wants to deal with any of that. You don't want to deal with any kinds of abusive behavior or attitudes and things like that. I want to see you home at nine o'clock and you're not even living together. You know, <laughs> you know? Right. You know that kind of thing. You know, where are you? And uh, 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 call me at eight o'clock, but it's eight oh one. You know, my last boyfriend, he didn't he didn't call me on time. You know, I asked him to call, you know, and he didn't. I'm like, wait a minute. I just got in the door. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So these are right, kind of issues right. that people wrestle with in relationships. Great points. Uh, great points, Omar. Great point about, you know, everything that you said. I feel you. I agree with it 100 uh, percent. And um, hey, I, I think uh, from what you brothers are saying, and, you know, the things that, you know, um, you have stated about this particular question, what do you feel is one of the main reasons why Christians are developing successful relationships? I think uh, you have said some really good things, some really good things. And so we move on to the second question and get a little deeper. We're going to get a little deeper, uh, get a little bit more specific. Uh, but let's talk about this. Um, do you feel like a, a man and woman's historical upbringing has a lot to do uh with their relationship expectations and let me let me read it again so it's a clear understanding of the question and also just for the people who's watching out there uh, and thank you so much everybody for being tuned in uh thank you ss and k thank you family and friends thank you all the other groups that's watching thank you so much for being tuned in uh these brothers are really dropping some really good stuff some really good points um and as you see in the comments brothers you know uh, you're getting that love. They're letting you know how they feel about what you're saying. And so do you feel like a man and woman's historical upbringing has a lot to do with their relationship expectations? And anybody can answer that question. <laughs> I was I saying, they're not ready. I was saying, not I was ready. Saying, <laughs> uh, this might be different, but no, <laughs> no. Uh, 
I, I think because more so here's why I say no. We find the culture has really has a stronghold when it comes to dating and relationships. So you will have people with these kind of expectations and where you say, wait, wait a minute, what type of cultural background and up, I mean, not culture, what type of upbringing and background did you have to where you have these outrageous expectations? Like you will have ladies, cause I think it's more pronounced in our ladies to where they'll say things like, I need a man with this type of living, this type of income. And these are these first class income. And it's like, wait, do you come from that? Do you have parents who were bona fide six and seven figure earners? Were you raised in Jack and Jill? Did you go to private school? Did you travel abroad? Were you in boarding school? And the crazy part about it is they're not. You have ladies who don't come from money, who don't come from wealth, who just all of a sudden, because of what the culture is saying and repeating and drumming, that they're saying that, yeah, I want a man that this, this, and this, and this. And it's like, well, what did your parents do for a living? What did your mom do for a living? You were not exposed to that type of lifestyle that you're saying that's a new requirement. So in that sense, I say no. I think it's more so of what they want, what they told that they can get, what the culture has kind of fed into it. I think that stuff has more a stronghold in what people are saying that they want than their upbringing. Because if we be honest, a lot of their upbringing, and I'm going back to their mother and their father, most, a lot of people now in, in this, our generation and younger, they date, they choose mates more uh, separate from what their parents, grandparents, and families raised them to. This is the, one of those individualistic decisions where we can do things on our own. It's not about how you were raised. It's not what you were taught. It's not what you were uh, part of your upbringing and training. This is you being a complete individual. So that's why I say no. Uh, you know what? For me, I can say yes to a certain extent. Uh, only because sometimes people don't have parents, so they allow the people around them to raise them. Uh, uh, the, uh, and sometimes it's not necessarily the environment, but other people become influences around them. Uh, if you're in urban areas, right, and you don't have parents, but they allow the gangs to raise them. They allow, uh, they allow people who, who they see as Mac daddies to teach them how to, uh, I, I said Mac daddy. <laughs> I, I mean, what, what I'm trying to say is other people who, who, uh, who have these relationships going from woman to woman to woman to woman, allow them to influence them in their personal life and say, this is how you cheat a lady. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. go out with this girl and you go out with this girl, having sex with more than one girl at the same time and not being a communicator committed relationship looks all right to him in his eyes. Now, mm -hmm. it really also depends because sometimes the parents um, and sometimes you may not live in a two parent two parent household and you may see the mother or you may see the father or you may see the father or the mother uh, have relationships and it may go through a revolving door, you know, so they may think and feel that having more than one relationship uh, is OK. Uh, in terms of, 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 of having more than one sexual partner, you know, because I, I've known families where there was uh, one person in the household uh, where the mother or the father had more than one girlfriend. All right. And that may have influenced them to say, hey, well, I can do the same thing. That's my father. I can emulate that when I go out into the world because they really don't have any positive images uh, in their personal life, uh, uh, even women. You know, uh, they'll have more than one boyfriend, like a revolving door. There's nothing wrong with having a mate. But when you see that constant revolving door, and that's why some women don't allow a lot of, they don't allow a lot of men in their homes because they don't want their children to see, you know, uh, a, a revolving door of many men going back and forth because it just don't look right, you know. And so they sort of like wait until they feel like this is the, the one that they actually want to have. And they're perfect, they're, the, the person that they actually want and they like so that they can children can actually see the person that they actually want to be with later on 
as they grow together and actually develop a relationship with one another. And so that happens in relationships. Uh, but my thing is that it can happen to a certain extent. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of factors. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, and uh, I'm going to let Lonnie jump in there if he wants to in just a moment, but I'm going to say, yeah, there's definitely an environmental factors of how you grew up, uh, how uh, men and women have grown up in their households. Uh, some people come from single parent homes. Uh, some people come from two parent homes. And as uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, people who are watching, I think it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Shireen. She was saying that, she, you know, uh, she didn't, you grow up uh, with two parents in home and so uh she she was not familiar with affection and i think all that you know if you if your your father didn't hug you if your mother didn't hug you if they didn't show that type of affection it can affect you uh in relationships with the opposite sex because you're not used to a person showing that type of affection i think that uh is a factor as well is also as i've dated in the past I do realize that there's a, a certain uh, classiness. Uh, there are uh, some women are, are more educated to uh, how they should treat a man or, or how they interact with a man because they have that example in the home from their father. So their father has taught them how to uh, operate when they're alongside a man, uh, what to expect, uh, what you should look for or and how you should treat a man you know usually that father figure is that first example for that woman and i realize that those women most of those women that i've dated in the past who had a two parent home and the father was there uh, it, the treatment was a lot better and i mean they kind of understood like just little small things like this is you know what i do they were more uh i would say catering uh, more nurturing you know because they knew how to take care of a man because they had the example and then when I look back on it and I look at some of the ladies that did not have that example, uh, all of that was kind of lacking somewhat. If you know what I'm saying, you know, if we can be real, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that, that that's a real thing. But not that they didn't want to. Maybe they just lacked the skills or weren't used to, you know, knowing how to. That's, that's the key to And even us men, because I, I didn't grow up with my father in a home, uh, so I didn't have a great example of any man. Uh, but I do thank God for my uh, pastor growing up. He was the first man uh, that was ever a great uh, person that I felt uh, was a great role model for me, you know. And so that that was really vital in my life. And so uh, it's important for, for men to have role models and to be able to uh, see what a real man is, is supposed to look like or how they're supposed to operate, how they're supposed to act. How do they talk to their wife? You know, how did, did the father talk to the wife? How did the mother talk? to uh, the husband. And, and, and just one more example, I realized I was uh, dating someone and she, when she got angry, she used a lot of foul language and uh, she was, uh, her, her conflict resolution skills was just not really good. And to get her points across, he's cussing you, I'll be little on you. Uh, but I was just realizing, you know what, this, you know, this is not usual. I mean, this is, she's used to dealing with toxic dudes, you know, for her to be like that and exercise that masculine energy. But I heard a phone call that she was on with her mother and her mother was cussing her out the, the same way. You mother that for this and all that stuff, cussing her out. You ought to be ashamed of yourself and you're no good. And so all that does play a factor and all that kind of relationship that she had with her mother and just those examples, I really do think that the historical uh, background of an individual and how they were raised does play a part in relationship expectations, what they expect from you. And uh, and when you expect something from them, it, they may have a hard time or they may be really accepting of it or it, they may, because they've been taught and they've seen examples, they may be able to accommodate you and make you feel uh, like you should feel as just a human being and just being, you know, with, with somebody who you're supposedly loving and caring for. And I know I went long, but did you want to drop in there, uh, Lonnie, and add to this? Yes. Um, I think there's three things that I want to bring to your attention. I think it has a little bit what Chris was saying, outside influences and in the household. And I'm going to go to my third point in a moment another influence that might have influenced. Now, 
yes, outside influences our society expected, and some of us are unfortunate. Now, I think the parents, because I grew up in a two-parent household. I had my father and my mother in my home, and my and my parents respected one another, and they engaged in us too. I mean, a, a father could be in be in the house, but but if he doesn't engage in uh, if he doesn't engage with his children, then he all he's doing is just taking up space. Okay, and so I, I think a parent growing up in a two parent household does influence. It influences myself and my sisters, and my you know my parents. They was married for thirty nine years, and they had their ups and downs. I seen them arguing, but they was there until my father was called home to be with the Lord. Uh, one other thing I want to that may have something to do with both of them is generational curses. And what I mean by that, I mean, during slavery, the slave master has taught blacks to fight one another. That's what the slave master doing, has done. And, and, and going, through, going out all through the generations, over 200, 300 years, you know, some of that could be generational curses and everything where some people have a, a father in home and some people don't have a father in home. And so I think that has somewhat of a li little bit of influence. If you, when you study the science of sociology and everything, um, that's, you know, that's how I, 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 how I found out. And I was taught this when I was in the, uh, in the AME church that slavery could, you know, generational curse could have something to do with it also. And that's something that we have to realize, especially among black families. That's why so much black on black crime is going on today and everything. And so, I think it has, I think that, I think there's three of these influences have something a little bit to do with how we grew up. It depends on, it depends on how the parents uh, treat each other. Sometimes you have to, the buck's got to stop here. And that's why the churches need to stand in the gap for the family and everything, especially when there's lacking of, like to know what you're talking about, you know, cursing, you know, mother curse each out and everything and cursing out the child and all this sort of stuff. Because our parents wouldn't let us cuss in the household, they wouldn't <laughs> let us do that. And so, um, and so, base, basically, I grew up in a loving family, and I thank God I grew up in a loving family. And my heart goes out to those who did not have like a father figure growing up. You know, I've seen my father buy my sister their first dress. I see my father did my sister's hair. I see my mother who always cared about us. And they and they were loving parents, and they, and they did not have much education. But there was a lot of love growing up and everything. And I thank God that I can take that into a relationship. Now, everybody's not fortunate. I understand that. But um, I just could. I don't know if I could be in a toxic relationship, you know, basically because I prefer to be someone who grew up in a similar, you know, background. Because, see, one thing we have to be careful about is generalizing everybody into one category. Like one person, everybody grew up in a bad home. All black men are mad. All black women are, are standoffish, all that stuff. No, you know, there's, you know, everybody, I mean, we're all created equal. You know, some of us grew up in a great home. Some of us did have a father. Some of us are dealing with generational curses. And we have to, we as black Christians have to understand that the buck stops here, that we can, and if we can break generational curses, and if the church could stand in the gap, if possible, then maybe we can alleviate some of this stuff. Now it's not going to take; it's not going to happen overnight. Because see, one day it's not going to twenty solve twenty years of dysfunction or twenty years of not having a father. But, but, but I believe that God can stand in the gap wherever He's lacking. God can stand in the gap so that we can have wholesome, you know, wholesome relationships. And 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 then we have to take authority and say the buck stops here. And and you don't have to be ashamed of what happened in the past, amen. amen. And so, um, amen, so I think it's something to both of, of of that, and then that third one, the generational curses. So that's probably why um, to answer your question to Mel and everything about uh, our our influences can determine our relationships. I think it's a bit, a little bit of uh, some of the points I mentioned. So, amen. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you, Lonnie, and. Uh, what the other brothers were saying as well. Uh, did anybody want to add to what Lina was saying? All uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. One of the things uh, when it comes down to influence uh, and whether if uh, anyone um, influences them 
in terms of them having any uh, uh, influence based on the relationships that they may currently have when they grow up. Uh, the, uh, we can look at a whole bunch of factors, for example, finances, uh, where if your parents were traditional or non-traditional, you know, did your parents, uh, did the father take care of the mother? Was she a, uh, was the mother, uh, did, did she stay at home? Uh, did the father work? And did, was, was the father lazy? Uh, and so, especially with a lot of men, uh, uh, maybe they not, may not have that working kind of spirit uh, when they were younger. And so it influenced them by the uh, time they grew up and they would say, oh, well, you know, my father didn't work. Uh, why do I have to get a job? Because my mother always works. She was back, breaking her back, taking care of all the kids and stuff like that. And so that sort of like uh, bounces, bounces off of the father to the son. And he feels that uh, that laziness kind of spirit uh, can be carried into that. Uh, and that's not for everybody. Uh, right. And so you may even have the father who's taking care of the mother. And uh, the father may have said, taught the son to say, hey, you know, when you grow up, I want you to take care of your uh, take care of your wife and take care of your kids. Uh, have the mother be a stay at home mom. Uh, don't let her, you be the boss. You be the man of the house. Put your foot down. Don't let her talk about it. And he may carry that mentality into the relationships that may have in the future when he grows up. Now, that's not the case for everybody, but everybody's different on how they uh, view relationships, uh, especially with the mothers uh, and, and, and the women uh, that grew up around them uh, and how they how their daughters uh, are, uh, are brought up at the same time. So it, it really all depends on the person's thinking, and some people don't want to emulate their father. They don't want to emulate their mother because they lived a totally different lifestyle. They've changed their mind. They've grown up. They've um, uh, they want to get out of that brokenness. They want to get out of that lifestyle that their family had had in terms of uh, 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 what, what's what's the kind of household that people have much more like a toxic bro broken house. You know, <laughs> they don't want to no longer live in that environment. So they want to break the mold and create a whole new life for themselves. They want to live in a household to where the family can be raised up properly, to where they would have a loving, kind relationship with the mother and the father at the same time. Everybody doesn't want to live the lifestyle that they used to have because they want better for their kids at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And since since we're all ministers on, on this broadcast. I think that's why we all bring a unique perspective. I know Elder Tomel talked about not having a father figure. I'm a part of that group as well. Reverend Lonnie had a great father figure in his household. I don't know about you, Dr. Dr. Omar, but for us, we all bring a different perspective and gauge. And so it, us all being ministers over charge of people's lives, there's only so much that I'm going to give you, especially at a certain age. If you're in your thirties telling me that, oh, my father wasn't there and I didn't have no one to show me these things. And, and my thing is this, if you were a teenager, I would listen to you a little whole lot more. But in your thirties, I'm more like, I wanna see how you're moving now. And all that, I didn't have a man or a father as an example. There's only so much leeway that I'm gonna let you get by with that. Mm -hmm. Because I look at, and when I'm dealing with, even in a ministerial capacity, not even talking about dating, I'm more looking at what have you made with the decisions in your own life? Because get, I didn't have a father figure, neither did I. You know, I didn't grow up in the best household, neither did I. What have you been, ever since you've been a legal adult, what decisions have you made to your life? I want to see how you're moving. That's, that's, that's what I assess grown-ups on. And even as individuals, whether it be ministerially or even in my own dating life. I think you make a great point with that. And, and, and I'll, I'll come from this perspective, too. It is uh, the lack of not having a father in my life that helped me to become the man that I am today. And so and I also want to say this because I wish there was some young men that was watching. I wish there was some teenagers. Uh, maybe uh, parents can share it. Uh, but sometimes. And you got to understand God's will for your life. And we, we, we come in real spiritual now is that you may be upset because when I was younger, I was upset that my father wasn't there. He was never there. I only met my father about eight or nine times in my life. 
And so in all the stories that I heard about him, that he was not really a good man. And he was also Rolling Stone, where, you know, he got kids all over the place, having sex with different women at the same time, an adulterer, cheating on my mother, all of that stuff. So uh, that is an example that I said, I'm not going to follow. I'm not going to be like my father, you know. And so what you said, Christopher, makes a, a lot of sense. And there are only so many excuses, like you said, that you can use uh, because, uh, like Lonnie was saying, these generational curses, they can be broken. But, you know, it all starts with us. It starts with what are we going to do since, since these things have happened to us and we're experiencing certain hurts and certain pains? What are we doing to overcome those hurts and those pains? And so that's what you said uh, really makes a lot of sense. And I, I agree with everybody. I agree with, with Lonnie. I agree with Omar. Omar made some good points. Lonnie made some wonderful points. And I think all of these factors, all of these factors, uh, especially concerning uh, parents uh, being there in a person's life and lack thereof, I think those are all factors in everything that you all just stated. And so we're, we're kind of going into the the same into the I guess the same area of question. Now we now we're gonna get a little more deeper into this with this. And I, I'm saying now how important to you as at because you you stated too, Christopher, all of us are ministers. Uh and so uh how important is it for you to know a woman's financial situation? Because we touched on that too, just a little a tad bit. Uh how important is it for you to know? a woman's financial situation. And then the second half of that question, because we're going to kind of get a little bit uh, in your business just a little bit, but how important uh, is it for you to know a woman's financial situation and sexual preferences before entering a committed relationship? So we talk about first, how important to you is knowing a woman's finances and how important is, is that sexual preference and talk? And so we're going to get a little candid. I know I am, but you go <laughs> ahead, brothers. Anybody can jump in there. Uh, I guess okay. we'll start. Uh, okay, go ahead, Omar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, so what, what, the, what was the sexual preferences and what was the financial, right? Yeah, yeah. How important is uh, yeah, knowing you a know financial situation before getting, you know, making that commitment to her? You know, from, I'll say, getting into the relationship to engagement to marriage when it's getting serious. Or even before. Yeah, you know what? When the relationship leading to marriage, uh, but uh, when it comes down to finances, the same thing that they would ask us. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we're just guys, you know, and that's pretty much it. You know, uh, the same thing. A lady will ask us where we are, where we are at financially. And so um, just as important, they would ask us that question. Uh, if we have sense enough, we would ask the exact same question, too. Where are we at financially? Because if you're talking about long range marriage, yeah. you're going to want to talk about your finances. You don't like your finances may not be the best, but at least you have you would have that discussion with one another. You want to talk about how you want to build with one another. Now, everyone may approach it differently. Some people want people to have all things together before you get married. They'll say, oh, I want you to work on your credit. I want you to uh, work on those things before we get married. And some people will say, hey, well, you know what? Uh, financially, I'm not really there, but I'm working I'm working on it right now. Um, and I, you'll know that, that the other person is working on it, and then they'll help build with one another. So that really depends on what you are coming to the table with. And that discussion should be between them two and nobody else. Everybody has a different path on how they actually want to build their relationship, you know? And so, but sexually, you will want to have that discussion too, even before you get married. Number one, because you want to know if that person is a, a virgin. You may not have to tell all the details of your sexual life, but you will at least want to get a heads up about where they are, you know, how many partners you have had, you know? Uh, sometimes you don't have to talk about 10 and 20 and all that other stuff like that, but um, are you disease and drug free? You know, you want to know about that. If they have HIV AIDS or anything of that, have you have any communicable diseases such as herpes and syphilis and things of that nature? You want to discuss those things because you don't want to be married to someone with all that stuff and you taking that stuff in you as well. You know, um, and so that that can really that that can actually have a a, a hard um, a, a hard issue. 
that you may have going into that relationship because you, you have trusted that person. And I know people who have gotten married who have HIV wow. because the other partner didn't tell them that they had HIV when they got married because they trusted them because they loved them and they trusted them. And they have told them that they were disease and drug free. Why don't you just go down to the clinic and get tested? It's one, two, three. If, if you're in a relationship and they're constantly dancing around the issue, that's the point where you need to back up and you need to question why right. you are actually getting married to that person. Because if you can't be, if they can't be trusted on that issue, well, we don't need to get tested. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I really don't need, why do I got to get an HIV test, you know? Why don't we just have sex and just call it a day? You know, you have to be careful about those kinds of brothers and those kinds of sisters. I see, I said both. <laughs> so I, I won't be kind of biased. So someone won't say, oh, well, he's talking about men. He's talking about women. Well, it's, it's both, you know, have to come to the table with those particular issues. But let the couple decide on their own and what they may have to, in, in terms of how they will go about their future together. And yeah, let me interject before the other brothers jump in there. And let me tell you why I will not... Uh, ever ask a woman again what her sexual history is because I was talking to a woman and and she said I asked her a certain amount and I threw out there a 30. 30? Has, you've been with 30 men? And she said you don't want to know the answer to that question. And I said <laughs> was, it, was it 50? You don't want to know the answer to that question. And then I got to has it been more than 50? You don't want to know the answer to that question. So she was very promiscuous, you know, growing up, but she had self-esteem issues. So like you were saying, Omar, as long as, you know, she's free of STDs, but that was not appealing to me knowing that she had slept with all those men. Now, that's maybe some information that I should have <laughs> had access to, because even if you ask a question, women can make it up, men can make it up. They don't have to be truthful and tell you the amount. And, and, and most likely they're not going to tell you the number. But go ahead. I, I see Christopher laughing, but anybody can jump in there and, and I'll I'll give mine a little bit later. Go ahead. Reverend Lina, you got something on that? <laughs> yeah, I got something on it. Um now, let me let me tell, see, I came up from the now, uh, uh, let me let me start with the financial first to answer the question. Uh Tamel, um what I want to know is about her attitudes towards finances. Yes, we want to know about our financial positions and everything and, you know, our assets and all that stuff, balance sheets, you know, <laughs> job-wise, salary. But I want to know her attitude towards money. Are we going to be frugal or are we going to just spend within our needs? You know, you, you know, you know spend within our means. As long as she does not go, as long as we don't go above our means, have a budget, use common sense, the finances, and everything, then then that's a winner for me because um, it's not how much money you have; it's what you do with the money that you already got. That's what I'm talking about. Because um, I've seen my parents be frugal, and when they had extra extra money, they would take you know take a trip and stuff. I know. I see my parents go on cruises and stuff. I see my father, you know, we used to go on vacations together. And my dad was a custodian in the school system back then. And my mother didn't work, but that was back in the old generation, you know, back, I'm talking about back in the 70s. And so, and so it depends on her attitude for money. But if she's, but, she, but if she's just reckless with money and everything, you got to have a new pair of shoes every week. And all that, to stay in the mall and everything, that's a deal break for me um, and, and everything and, um, and all that. So, but, but there's certain things that I would do, but, you know, I try to do, I'll do the best I can and everything, but we would have to discuss it. Like Omar said, that's got, that has to be discussed, especially during premarital counseling and everything and classes and all that and stuff that churches that, that offer. And I think people should go premarital counseling before you get married anyway and they need to be talked about. Now, when it comes to sex and everything, I came up during the free love days of the 70s and it was free love back then, but um, I agree with Omar. I think that that we need to get tested and everything, and I did take an AIDS test one time, and of course I tested negative, 
and it's free. And even if you go down to the health department, they got a whole. I, I went to. I had, I had to take a test one time, a TB test, and down at the health department, local health department, they had a great big candy jar full of condoms that just was sitting there. And then and, and and so, but a lot of people don't take them because they're having, you know, unprotected sex and everything. But it's going to take honesty, and it's going to take honesty and be trustworthy to um to talk about your sexual you know, prefaces and everything. Now, one thing I want to bring up is that, you know, we always talk about the women being the virgin. We hold the woman accountable for being the virgin. And let me be honest with you, fellas, and those of you watching outside, when a man says he's a virgin, we get laughed at. And when a man says he has had sex, he has been promiscuous, he ain't got baby mamas all the time, then they think that they think something wrong with us. And let me, and, and let me, uh, let me dispel that rumor right now and clear up any, any mis misconceptions. Sex is a wonderful thing, but my position is sex is only wonderful when I'm in covenant relationship and marriage to the woman that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. Not going around sleeping with, you know, laying down with other people all the time because I did that back in the day. I did that back in the day and I had soul ties. I had to break that spirit out of me because when I get married, I don't want no nasty stinking soul ties going in you know going into a marriage <laughs> I, I mean i mean really no, because no. i don't want to compare um i don't want to compare um if i date somebody named um ashley and i'm and i'm and, and i'm gonna mess around with laquisha and, and shantae and all this stuff i don't be calling her name when i'm making love to my wife ashley no and so that's why soul ties have got to be got to be broken and i i would like to see the counties where you apply for your marriage license make sure you have a blood test done uh, hiv mm -hmm. test done. i think that needs to be done too when you get your marriage license and everything and so i think local counties should do that so i just want to say you know so that's my perspective on it yeah uh, I, I just want to make a, a reference to that because in certain uh states it's required you know, to actually do that, to have an actual blood test, you know, uh, wherever you're living at, you know, those things are actually, um, oops, sorry, buddy. yeah, some of those things are actually required depending on where you reside at, you know, so um, look into that, you know, wherever you live at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. Absolutely. No, go ahead. Jump in there, sir. Okay. Well, the first question on the finances, uh, how important it is to me to, to know a woman's financial status and situation that they let. I probably say at the most it's a, a two, a two out of 10, meaning not that important to me. Uh, I don't ask for a woman's financial status, her credit report and things like that. I've dated women who made considerably much more money than me. And in the end result, I'm still the one who has to pretty much finance the dates and things like that. So uh, I've dated women who make considerably less. Uh, like Brother Liney said, I'm more concerned about your attitude. If I can work with you, can you follow instructions? Can If I say we're going to do this with our finances or we're going to go here because of this and that, can you cooperate with me on that? Uh, so I've never cared about a woman's credit report or how much she made or, or all those things like that. Uh, cause I know that's really one of those things that I kind of understand that I'm probably going to be the breadwinner and financer of my relationship and even in the future of my marriage as well. So, uh, but even when, when it comes down to a woman's sexual preference, I thought you were asking like, is she bisexual? Is she into this or into that? But <laughs> cause you said sexual preference, but, uh, I'll say this, uh, when it comes down to it, uh, I think those are valid conversations. You know, how, how do you view sex? Those are natural questions to ask in a dating phase and even in the relationship phase. You have to come to an understanding of how this woman approaches sex. So uh, if that should lead you to wanting to know how many people have you been with, all that is on the table. I mean, definitely, I don't see nothing wrong with getting tested. So all those things are on the table, man. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, 
Uh, we are saying uh, farewell to uh, Omar. He had to uh, go and take care of a, a another important uh, situation uh, that he has going on. And so uh, we appreciate you, uh, Dr. Omar, for uh, being a part of the discussion. And we appreciate you taking the time out uh, to have this discussion with us uh, for the time that you did. So thank you so much, Omar. And we appreciate your perspectives and your thoughts. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, and so I do, I'm kind of with you, Lonnie. I'm with Christopher. I definitely think um, as couples, when you're moving into a serious commitment that you should get tested, I think that's very important uh, because you don't know what could be lingering from the past, especially if you've been uh, sexual. But because, you know, I'm at the doctor's, uh, I get a checkup uh, used every three months. Uh, so um, I I just get to get tested anyway, just just because I, you know, have the opportunity to get tested. And I always want to know uh, my status, you know, and so that's just me, though. And so I think that's important. But I do think I do Amen. think credit score is important. Uh, I, hey, what is that credit score looking like? Because I got to know, you know, how much debt that we're dealing with, because as Lonnie was stating, is that uh, some women and since we're men, we're talking about women haven't been really uh, good stewards over their finances. And so. Uh, like you said, the high spenders and running up credit cards and that kind of thing. You do have to have those conversations about where you stand. So, you know, once you get into the relationship, OK, so we're going to have to improve in this area. So I, I do want to see that credit score. I mean, when it's serious, I'm talking about engagement to marriage. We're about to get married. Uh, and, it, and even before that, if you're willing to do that and even the salaries, because I have to know that I can afford you, because if you're going to, you know, because it, it if a woman is going to to decide to not work okay and you know we'll talk about that we have to talk about can we afford you you know not going to work but if you're not going to work you got to be satisfied with the income that i have to live off of that you know what i'm saying i think that's that's important so if we're going to live off of one income you know how much i make uh, you may not be able to you know get those extra gucci bags and stuff like that if we're just living off of one income like that but those are many factors that you have to consider. And I think when, especially, you know, we're, we don't have any kids now, but I know when kids come in the picture, that in itself is a job. And I would love, you know, for my wife to take care of the kids and stay home and take care of the kids. Cause I, I'm just, I don't trust uh, a lot of people these days with your kids. You just can't these days. Mm -hmm. So I think talking That's about awesome. the finances are very important. And I think, discussing salaries, all of that. I mean, I, I'd like to do that uh, with my potential spouse. I would really love to do that with my potential wife. And, you know, she has to know, you know, a woman has to know certain things. Can you take care of her? <laughs> Will you be able to provide the quality of life that she's looking for? And so I'm not a person that lives above my means. So if uh, I, you know, uh, meet a woman who wants to, you know, live more of a lavish lifestyle, either I'm going to have to make more money for her, or we just not going to be compatible. That's just, that's just as honest as you can get, because you, 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 some women, you know, their tastes are a little bit more expensive than others, and so you got to be able to afford uh, the woman that you choose. I, I, I believe that. And let me go back to one thing that I always say in these live discussions: uh, you have to be compatible in three areas. I call it the three S's. So you have to be compatible spiritually, socially, and sexually. And all those three areas, I think those compatibilities are key. And when we, when I was talking about, and I know Christopher, you were saying, now I was it, but you made a good point about, did she have a uh, a homosexual past? Uh, was she a, 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 a lesbian? You know, uh, sisters got to ask, do you have a, a homosexual past? Uh, did you ever have, you know, sex with men? You know, and I would hope brothers and sisters would be honest with that, because I know that that spirit, that 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 homosexual spirit, as far as what I've heard testimonies from Donnie McClurkin and Donnie McClurkin said he can't even have he's not sure if he can be in a relationship because of the struggle is there. So that's that's the kind of honesty that you need. You know, I mean, it's, it's public. It's public record. It's nothing I'm, I'm making up. He stated that he gave the testimony. I don't want people to think I'm making things up, saying things. That's not true, but that's what it is. But I didn't think about that, Christopher, until you said that. I mean, you do have to know because that would be a factor with me to know, okay, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready to deal with, you know, that. But 
I know people have been healed, set free, and delivered. God can, can change anybody, deliver anybody, and set anybody free from whatever it was. Whatever our past was, God can set you free. But there's still certain struggles that you may have to deal with with a person who has certain things that's happened in their past. Well, yeah, but but that's something that I don't sidestep. So yes, even sir. if your history, even if you were with women, if you were in threesomes, if you were bisexual, if you were a lesbian, I need to know those things if I'm going to get in a relationship with you. So even like whether if you were promiscuous in your past, all that stuff like that, great. God can forgive all things. I, I, I can testify. But I still need to know that because especially when it comes to us being ministers, we are yeah, in the spotlight. We are somebody who's going to face judgment, face the eyes of people. We've been lied on before. We've been talked about before. We are built for things like that. Yes, now, sir. what I don't want is a weakness in the person who I'm espoused to. I don't need that uh, extra kink. So I don't need anybody else telling me something about the person I'm with that I've not heard from her first. So that's, oh, that's how, how I lay it out to them. You can tell me, because if I got to hear from somebody else, they're going to have the upper hand. Yeah, and I feel you on that. That would be kind of devastating, especially if you grew up in different cities and towns and you go and visit her and her family and, and everybody is, you know, looking at you kind of funny because of her past and you don't know exactly what's been going on. And so I feel you with that. That would be some devastating news you got that maybe she was probably mm -hmm. super promiscuous or she did have a homosexual past and they're wondering like, what's going on here? Did she tell him? <laughs> did she tell him? You know? I, I tell Christian women this all the time. A guy will forgive a whore faster than he forgives a liar because he'll marry a stripper. A stripper can get off the pole, but a woman that lies to him, he can never tell if she's telling the truth or not. Mm. So you might as well tell the truth at the beginning because I'll forgive you for being a whore, a past and all this stuff, but I can't forgive a liar because I can never tell whether you stopped lying. I can tell when you got off the pole. Mm. I can tell when you stopped lying. Oh, man, that's yeah, awesome. And, and a prostitute, you know, if you think about a prostitute, a prostitute, one thing about that, Chris, at least she's being honest with you. She yeah. says she's been, you know, been, you know, been a, you know, a hooker and everything sure. and danced on the pole at a strip club. And also at least, at least she's showing you who she really is. And those are the ones that when God cleans them up, there's a saying that you can't, catch a you can't clean a fish until you catch them mm -hmm. yeah you bring them into church you clean them up and everything and they'll and, they'll, and they, they, they they be the best people that can evangelize and make a, a good wife because they've been out there they can they can deliver somebody some other sisters who who've been down that pr promiscuous you know promiscuous highway and everything because you know you know there's some I had a Sunday school teacher admitted to me that she was promiscuous and she was on my Sunday school teacher. She was the best teacher that that we ever had. But, but I agree with Chris. But I can't stand when people are like dishonest and everything. Don't you know? Don't come with no deception and stuff. Let's be real. Let's put it out on the table. Let's be trustworthy. Because I'm gonna tell you something. I mean, a person, a person will forgive you for lying. Forgiveness is a decision, but trust is a process. It's a process. When you when your trust is betrayed. And everything you forgive, but can but can you trust them, or can God trust you? Because see, at, at the end of the day, trust has got to be earned back. You know, you can't pay for no trust. You can't buy no trust. You can't try to set your way back into trust and give flowers and all that other stuff. No, it's, it has to be earned sure. and everything. And and honesty still makes the best policy because. Because lying is, is so devastating. It's devastating when people lie to you and, and deceive you and mislead you and all of that stuff. But when somebody's honest and everything and tell the truth, I'm going to tell you something. That's when the Lord can come in and heal you because God cannot help you when you lie. He knows you're lying, but we can't help you if you're lying. But when you're honest, boy, I'm telling you. <laughs> and we can, we can come yeah. together, baby. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I always do say that too, Lonnie. Uh, when we're honest with God, 
he can really help us when we're honest with God. He can really help us. Yes, sir. Ourselves. And so a beautiful point, beautiful points uh, by, you know, all of you, by you and uh, Chris. And so I think uh, we're getting into the nitty gritty of things. I think we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, uh, getting some some real good perspective on, uh, you know, <laughs> certain things. And I just wanted to say, yeah, those uh, men and women who have been delivered and set free, they'd be great, you know, uh, soul winners because they can win a lot of people who was in that same situation. That's what you, God uses our 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 past and to to reach those uh, who have experienced the same thing. So He gets the glory yeah. out of our situation, and we're able to win souls because when we do witness and tell us about Jesus Christ and our experience, they can relate to it, and then it becomes anointed, and then He can you know really uh, change somebody's life, and then they can come into the kingdom yeah. of, of win their soul. And so uh, I do believe that. Uh, these the conversation uh, that we're having tonight is really beneficial uh, to the body of Christ. I think this is uh, stuff that you definitely need to discuss and talk about. I think, um, as I stated before, that uh, finances and sex are number one and number two reasons why Christians get divorced, and that's mm -hmm. in, in Christendom. And so, finance and sex, talk about it. Uh, you know, get candid with it. What do you like? Do you like this? Do you like that? What can you deal with this? Uh, you know, you got to discuss those things. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a raunchy conversation or a lustful conversation about, you know, uh, what I want to do to you and all that stuff. Nah, we talk about what are you into? Uh, what, what do you like? Uh, what have you experienced before? I mean, it's important because these are things that break up uh, marriages. Uh, yeah. Sex and finances, and so you really got to talk about it. You really got to talk about it. it. Uh, Jeff, let me add one more thing to if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely, um, sir. Uh, sex, finance, I agree, but also the lack of communication yes, that can sir. break up a marriage is because see, see, if you like, if you fall, if you grow apart and don't engage in one another, because see, God gave me a gift of communication. I'm talking about listening, I'm talking about following instructions, listening, talking engaging in one another and see and and and, and say like if if the communication gets shut down and you grow apart and you're trying to have a conversation they sit and watching tv even during sex you got to communicate you got to communicate about the finances and everything so i think the lack of communication is is a key and that's why that's what causes um relationships to, to crumble and i have seen it I knew a couple married 34 years. They grew apart. They divorced. 34 mm -hmm. years of marriage. I, I, you know, and I've, I've witnessed that. So, so I just want to plug that in there, brother Tamel. But, but I agree. I just want to add that little bit of nugget in there. Call oh, communication. Yes, absolutely. No, absolutely. That uh, communication is, is very important. It's very key, very key in developing re relationships. And, and that's what really causes issues is when the communication breaks down, you know, people, yes, sir. people can't be honest with one another. And I think, uh, you know, couples have to be brutally honest with one another. And so I know we're coming down to the last uh, few minutes. Uh, so we got about, I'll say about 11 minutes left. And so I do want to talk about some solutions. I want to talk about um, this question that I had for you guys. And we're tied into the end. Uh, but what are some important traits and characteristics that you are looking for in developing a romantic relationship with a woman. And this is gonna be personal for all three of us. It's gonna be different. And so what are some of those important traits and characteristics that you look for? And we just also, as a man, what is needed from a woman personally uh, to develop a successful relationship with you? What do you need as a man or what you feel would be beneficial in developing a successful relationship with a woman and also those traits and characteristics that you look for. And so I know it's loaded. Those are two loaded questions, uh, but you can answer them to the best of your ability. And then we'll go ahead and end the uh, discussion and conversation as we get through that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. The things that I look for and the characteristics that I look for in a woman it starts off with her disposition. I need a woman with a very pleasant disposition. And 
And I kind of looped all that into like her attitude, disposition, and what type of spirit she has. Whichever words you want to put in there, all of those things, I have to be able to sense that she has a pleasant one. So I think we're in this age now where it's cool for women to be mad or mean or frustrated or not smile or things like that. Or, or they look at that as I don't take no stuff or that RBF face. All of that stuff is the most unattractive thing that I've ever encountered. Come on, sir. So, Come on, yeah. yeah. So instantly, if a woman is, is in that zone where she feels that that's tough or that makes her strong or empowered, then immediately I can scratch her off my list. She can be a nine and a half on a scale of 10 and I'm crossing her out on my list because I need somebody who has a pleasant disposition, who has a smile and not afraid to use it. I don't like that hard exterior because that's not cute, that's not attractive. That's not where your power lies. So I need a woman with a, a, a strong spirit, a, a pleasant spirit, pleasant disposition, and even a pleasant attitude. Those are the characteristics that I look for. Uh, I need to, I, I want, I look for a woman with characteristics that can't, that's not afraid to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Cause uh, we're in this thing where, I mean, you remember men that, oh, that male ego, we used to hear stuff like that. Oh, that man, prideful man. Mm -hmm. well, here, those tables have turned now where we're in an era where women have become so prideful to where when they're wrong, they still find a ways to show you how you made them wrong. And, right, right. Oh, come on, man. You telling the truth. You heard telling the truth, man. <laughs> I have to apologize when I'm when I'm wrong and I have to apologize when she's wrong. And I'm just like, I'm not gonna deal with a woman who can't admit when she's wrong. One of the qualities, I would talk to a young lady and she tried to come at me with some stuff. And I said, no, we're not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do this. Talk to me tomorrow when you're better. And you know what she did? Two days later, she apologized. Her stock went incrementally up in my book because she was able to apologize. Man, that stuff goes a long way. I, I tell people this, mistakes are gonna happen. I'm gonna say something that offends you I'm going to say something that you disagree with. But in the action, when I do those things and you let me know, come at me in a correct way and we can iron these things out. So, I mean, I need someone who can who able to, to admit when they're wrong and, and things that I need. Now, <laughs> that's a different story. I mean, I'm in a ministry. I need somebody who can handle the demands of ministry, of busy life, and who knows how to also be a, a, an extension of myself. If I can't make it, I can send her if she if I need someone to go and speak to women and every advice that I would want to give to uplift women or to get them on a Christian walk. If I can send her in my state, that's the type of person that I need. Someone who can be graceful with people, but also warm and inviting at the same time. So, yeah. Oh, I feel you. I feel you big time. Everything that you said, I'm feeling you, man. That man, that's that's good. That's good. So you, you're talking good with that because that's that's. That's real important to me is conflict resolution skills. If you don't have good conflict resolution skills, we're probably not going to work. Yep. And like you said, uh, uh, some women that I've dealt with, they just, you know, they wouldn't admit when they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am the kind of person, if I've done something wrong, if I've hurt you, I will come to you and say, you know, I was, you know, I was wrong. I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have did that. But when a woman can't do that and be honest about her, uh, her flaws or what she did was wrong or what she said was wrong, then yeah, it's just not going to work. So you made some wonderful, wonderful points. But that conflict resolution is so vital. It's so vital. And peace is priceless. I continue to say, as a man, all a man wants is respect and a man wants peace when he comes home or when he's dealing with his woman. That's where he should yes, find sir. his solace, his, his peace, that love. He should find that with his woman. And like you said, I, I, I didn't think about that, Chris. I didn't think about that, Christopher. I'll say, I don't know if it, you call yourself Chris, but mm -hmm. Christopher, I didn't think about as far as even being in ministry. Will I have a woman that's capable of ministering to other women or ministering to people along with myself? I mean, you know, I, I really never really thought about was that going to be important to me? But when you're saying that, it makes a lot of sense. Like maybe I need to. Maybe think about that, that maybe I do need a woman that's going to be able to give a word 
you know, to uh, the masses too. Go ahead, Lonnie. Go ahead and jump in there, sir. Yeah, before I start, Chris, what was that first word that you said um, about disposition. what you for? A pleasant disposition? Disposition, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, um, to answer your question, uh, Brother Tamel, um, I'm attracted to women who are self-confident, a woman is self-confident, a woman of disposition, and a woman who has um, able to listen and to admit that she was wrong. But one of the things that I like about a woman is, is she's affectionate because I'm not the kind of person that just want wham, bam, thank you, sex, and all that stuff. No, I like, I like, um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a romantic freak. You know, I am. I, I like a romance guy. I came from the old schools back in the 70s, Isley Brothers, OJs and stuff that's smooth, talking, you know, jazz and stuff. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. I like I like somebody who is affectionate, kind. And one of the things that when you go out to a restaurant and if she treats the waitress bad, that could be a red flag right there. If she's bougie and um, standoffish and stuff, that's one of the things that turns me off about a woman is being standoffish. And um, I like a woman who respects and loves her family. That's one of my pet peeves is you got to get along with your family because I want to meet mama and them Papa and them, your brothers, your, your aunties, and all that, because if we get married, we're going to have to spend some time with them. And so um, that's what I'm looking for somebody that's frugal and somebody that's realistic and everything, because life life can be tough sometimes. And yes, problems, um, you know, problems going to happen. And that's why you, you mentioned conflict resolution. That's, that's the key right there, because in Isaiah says, we have to come and reason together. And so negotiation skills is what I'm looking for to be able to, to listen. And when I mean by listen, don't build a defense. Just listen to what I'm saying, and I'll listen to you and everything. But but if a woman is comfortable in her own skin, and I say this about plus-size women that I, I see an issue with, because a lot of plus-size women, don't they're not comfortable in their own skin. And so they, they build up a, a wall, and there's some brothers that like plus size women and stuff. So I say to those, you know, have some confidence and be comfortable in your own skin. And that that's conf is confident. And to answer your question about characteristics and everything, um, some woman who has a nice smile and not be hardcore, just like Christopher said, because if she comes all hard and everything, then I'm just going to just go, I say, next. And, and keep it moving yes. because am I right, Chris? You feel me on this, Chris? You're right. Yes. Yeah, man. Because I don't, I don't want nobody go be hard and everything and and just not smile and everything. I want to see a, a smile on your face, and I don't care if the young lady got a small gap in in, her, in the front of her teeth. I don't care about that. A lot of guys look at well, how's your feet look and all that stuff. I mean. Sh a, a woman can be pretty, but yet to some people could be rough around the edges. But as long as she's attracted to me, that's all that matters. Absolutely. Because I'm, I, you know, I, I, I just want to be the husband of one wife. I don't want multiple women. I just want one wife for one, one life, one wife for one life. <laughs> I hear what that. I'm looking for. One wife. I like that. For one life, not oh. only on earth, but also in eternity. And everything because I grew up around about 80% of my brothers who are friends of mine are married, been married about 25 years or, or, or more, and everything. So I got good examples. Plus, my past been married 49 years before his wife went home to be with the Lord. But but um, that's the kind of uh, that, those are some of the characteristics that I look for, and the rest of it, you know, keep in mind. I, I did a journal, I wrote a journal, my book here about what I'm looking for and everything. Um, I don't have I don't have it with me right now, but um because I put it away and everything, but um that's that you know that's that's what I'm look you know looking for as a wife, you know, somebody that um closer to my age or younger. Um and so um uh, you know I'm I'm a little bit of what my dad had when he, you know when when he selected my mother and everything. Uh some years ago. And so um, those are some of the characteristics 
I look for. But as long as she's honest with me, as long as we communicate with one another and be honest with me and, you know, admit that she was wrong. Because Proverbs 27, 6 says, the faith are the wounds of a friend, but the kiss of an enemy is deceitful. You know, we don't, we don't have to tell each other that wonderful all the time. Sometimes we do have our, our faults and everything, but being able to receive constructive criticism and give constructive criticism without blowing off the handle and everything. Because I was in a relationship to Mel with her. Well, I told her about herself after he broke up, and she just flew off the handle. <clears throat> like, I don't know what, man. She became a Tasmanian devil, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so um, just being able to communicate and be honest with one another. And so um, I, I, I don't mean to go on you know, all that, but. It's okay, but, man. It's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, man. So that's those are some of the characteristics. I look for a woman, but as long as she's affectionate, and as long as we can disagree uh, in love, and and that's the difference between disagreeing in love and disagreeing and screaming and yelling. Because I don't like to scream and yell. That's for children. And and one and one last thing, Tamel, when you come home yes, with sir. peace Take and everything, time, that is priceless and stuff. Because um, you yeah. know, because I'm gonna even when we go out on date. I want I want I want to be able to be in a relationship where we look forward to see each other on a date. And if we can do that, as long as we are whole, we can look forward to seeing each other when we come home at, at night and everything and lay down together and not have all this uh, and, you know, lay down and make love to each other and and just lay in each other's arms instead of what some of them are used to. Some guys, they have sex and they go in, that, go in the kitchen, smoke a cigarette and they, they don't no hugging, no holding nothing. Come on now. So that's my rest of my case. <laughs> man, beautiful, man. Beautiful words. Uh, beautiful words, man. Great points. Wonderful points uh, by you and uh, Christopher. Uh, uh, I mean, you guys dropped some, you know, some some bombs and some jewels, my man. I mean, I, I think from the uh, comments, you know, people are really feeling what you guys are saying. You know, they like what you're saying. They can agree with it. They can feel uh, your thoughts and your perspectives. You know, I really love that. I really love when uh, black men and women are getting an understanding of one another. And as me, I think for me is I want a woman to be brutally honest with me. Uh, even when it hurts my feelings, I think that sometimes because we love each other so much or we care for, for one another so much that we're afraid to That's really true. tell each other how we really feel. We're afraid to be honest. And even if it hurts my feelings, hey, Tamel, I did not like when you said that. And I have to be honest and say, hey, I didn't like when you said that or you did that. We have to be brutally honest and hurt each other's feelings sometimes. And you can do it intact. It doesn't have to be, you know, oh man, you want you, you know, nigga, this and oh, I, I mean, I didn't have enough of, I had enough of that. I had enough of that to you know, with some women that I dealt with. It doesn't have to get to that level. You can just say, you know, I didn't like that what you said. I appreciate it if you, you know, do it a different way or and, and me too, you know, because you don't want to. You know, a raging woman is the worst, and that's it, that's just the truth. And it talks about that in the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> it's better to be on a rooftop than in a house with a raging woman. <laughs> so that's absolutely what it is. Yeah. So you guys make some wonderful points, and I think honest communication is key. Honest, brutal communication. Tell me the truth, even if it hurts my feelings. And I want to do the same because it's only going to build us up and bring us closer. Uh, and and that way, there's no secrets. There's no hiding anything. We all know what kind of person we are, what our triggers are, what bothers us. You have to be honest with that. You got to be honest about all those things that bother you and that trigger you. So uh, a man can be aware of it. I can be aware of it and and, and tread in a way uh, that's going to make the relationship successful. I also desire a good balance of spiritual and natural, uh, just a spiritual natural balance. I think it's important for a woman to be able to relate to all different kinds of people, not just church, not just church people, but different things, you know, knowing stuff about things that's going out there in the world. What are some of the current events going out there in the world? Uh, do you know who, who Lil uh, uh, Uzi is and these other people? Because that's effective in witnessing. If we don't know what's going out here and who's, you know, uh, celebrities and things of that nature, I don't mean you have to live your life and watch it for that, but just to know just a little bit of something about current events because we do have to witness and tell others about Jesus Christ. If we don't know what's going on and what's happening, then we can't be effective witnesses. 
but a, a nurturing, loving woman that has a good sense of humor. I love to laugh. I love to have a good time. I love to enjoy myself. Someone who has a good balance of wanting to go out and have a good time and some who will, you know, have a, still have a good time just at home watching a movie. Just in the presence of spending time with myself, I think it's so important, like I said, to have that spiritual, social, and sexual compatibility, and especially the social, being able to get along. Got to be best friends. I want to be best friends uh, with my, my potential mate. You know, I want to be able to talk about anything and oh, be yeah. able to express ourselves and just enjoy our company. Because if COVID-19 hasn't shown us or told us anything else, a lot of divorces are taking place because people can't stand mm -hmm. to be in the house with their mates for more than an hour without arguing and fighting, you know? And so when you got to be home, and you got to stay home and be around each other 24-7. It's different. It's different. You know, you ain't going outside the home to go to work. You right there. And she looking in your face and you looking in her face. You got to love one another. You got to love each other. It's got to be sincere. And so uh, I'll leave it there. And um, it's been a wonderful conversation with you, brothers. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed you. Also, uh, uh, Dr. Omar, I enjoyed you as well, sir. I appreciate your perspective. But Christopher and Lonnie, I really enjoyed this. I mean, the point you made was great, was wonderful. And I want to give you guys a chance to say some last words and then tell people how they can get a hold uh, get a hold of you and how they can connect with you. Uh, I, I'm thankful to be on this uh, panel, a part of this discussion. Uh, I hear people say things like, oh, we don't need to talk no more about relationships. I'm tired of hearing that. Well, <laughs> I'm a part of that that idea that, no, we're not talking about it enough. Yeah. Until we start seeing more and more of our generation, people get married. This is a very weakness, not just in our churches, but in our communities. And I think we need to keep on talking about it until we start seeing black men put rings on fingers of black women. And we cool. need to start building those families again. So. I'm willing to keep on having these discussions because I think we need each other. We need to be together. And all of us are ministers, but we can't have a church if the family is not together. And so this is the way that we need to step Absolutely. building our family back together. We need black men to start loving black women again and black women to start loving black men again. And if the solution can't come within the body of Christ, then the world is doomed. So we can keep on having these discussions. I'm Christopher Gordon. We can we can connect on Facebook. I'm on Instagram a little bit. <laughs> it's uh, meanwhile.in.houston. Meanwhile in Houston with a dot in between. So we can connect on any of those. And I'm glad to be a part of these type of solutions. Absolutely. Great to have you. Enjoyed your perspective. Dropped some bombs, some Jews. Uh, really enjoyed what you had to say. And from the comments, you can see it, too, that, you know, they're really feeling you, brother. So, you know, uh, really great to have you as part of the discussion. OK, well, Pat Tomel, I really I've always enjoyed, you know, the discussion on relations, about relationships. I love talking about relationships and, you know, communication and all that. And, um, you know, because it needs to be talked about. But one thing that I want to leave that I want to emphasize that love is not a game. Playing with somebody's emotions, playing games and being dishonest and all this other stuff and, 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 and playing with a woman's emotions is not a game. This it is serious because you're talking about some people's emotions. I've had people who confide in me. They wanted to take their own lives because of, because of the games and stuff. I read about stories of people being left at the altar. This is not a game, people. And so I just want to just share hmm. that, um, you, know, you know, that relationships need to be talked about. And, it, and if, if the family, see, the thing is, we have to, church has, must stand in the gap to, um, the church must stand in the gap and deal with, and deal with, deal with uh, the family and relationship. Because if we don't, then we subject to, um, the family is subject to go, and if the family go, like Chris was said, there there goes the church. Um, I can be reached at at Facebook. Doc, Facebook. I'm also on Charity, the, the group Facebook group Charity. You know, you're welcome to join us, and I can be found on Facebook, and I also can be found on LinkedIn. 
I'm on LinkedIn as well. So from a professional level, you can reach me on LinkedIn and everything. Instagram, I'm not on it as much, but you can, we connect on Instagram. And one more thing that I forgot, I failed to mention that one of my pet peeves I look for in a woman is that she must be able to celebrate Christmas. I'm going to tell you why, because I love Christmas, Thanksgiving, all the holidays and everything. But as long as she celebrates Christmas with me, then then she's all right in my book because uh, I'm a because um, I grew up in that era. That's new. <laughs> yeah, because some people don't celebrate. Everybody don't celebrate Christmas. That's true. But I love Christmas. I'm I'm I, there's a little boy in me because of the times we grew up in celebrating Christmas, and so um so if you can sing a little. If you can sing Jingle Bells to me, then, hey, you're all right in my book. So that's it. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> that's what's up, Lottie. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, but I got you. I feel, I feel you, man. About them foul boys. Yeah, 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 man. It's about, you know, yeah, definitely. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. That's, yeah, go Cowboys, but. Yeah, this is I just have great memories with the family on Thanksgiving. I always have a wonderful, great time. And I know Chris was over there. He hating he hate, he hate on the Cowboys. Hey, I don't know what his squad is, but he hating. <laughs> Who's your squad, Chris? Deshaun Watson and whatever team he chooses. Uh, to be uh, Watson, <laughs> the second greatest quarterback in the NFL currently as we speak. Only oh, he's dope. He's dope, though. I give it. Whoever he goes to, instant Super Bowl contender. So be on the lookout. <laughs> More talent Texas? than Dak Prescott could ever hope to have. Now I ain't gonna say all that. I ain't gonna say all that. Dak gonna get a, a, a Super Bowl before the Watson. I, I I can pretty much guarantee you that. Yes, sir. We different. It's all good. It's all good. Wait till football season come in. I'm gonna come back at you, my man. But but it's, it's wonderful. Always glad to have you, Lonnie. You know, Lonnie is a friend of mine, and so uh, Lonnie has a great sense of humor. Y'all don't know how funny Lonnie is. If you hang out with Lonnie, Lonnie's a funny dude. <laughs> he have me laughing all the time. Uh, but always great to have you, Lonnie. Always great to have you on these live discussions, man. And so you bring great insight, great perspective, uh, such as Chris, sure. great perspective, great wisdom, great nuggets. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, discussion. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. And I hope it was uplifting. I hope it was encouraging. And you can take some things uh, that we said, you know, from the broadcast and Adam G. Life, and hopefully uh, it'll be more fruitful from what we discussed. And we all are learning from one another. And I just, and this is the reason for these conversations, these discussions, because we want to bridge the gap of communication between men and women. We want to have more of an understanding of one another so we can have more successful relationships, especially black men and black women. You know, I'm just uh, yes, my people, I'm pro black for my people. I love black love as well. And I just want to see us doing better and thriving. And I want to be a part of that change. I want to break those generational curses and, you know, uh, have all my kids by one woman, my wife and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I have some goals and um, I just think it's a beautiful thing that we're able to come together and have this conversation. So we love you all with the love of the Lord Jesus. We love you. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, SSNK. Thank you, family and friends. All the other groups that's watching and that support me, I appreciate you. There's so many of them to name. Uh, and I don't want to leave any groups out, but you know who you are. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Anything else, fellas? All right. No, we love you. We love you all with the love of the Lord Jesus. Love um, you, brother. Have a wonderful evening. Good evening. Have a good evening, y'all. All right. Good night.